Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Content Authenticity Initiatives community events today. I'm Colleen Jose, Senior Marketing and Engagement Manager at the CAI. And today we're highlighting the work of our community members. These members, we feature SmartFrame and the Guardian Project are at the forefront of implementing the industry standard for content authenticity and provenance. We also wanna welcome our newest members and those joining us for the first time, welcome. Um, we're now a community of over 1000 members spanning industry and civil society. This is a milestone that demonstrates an urgency and a collective drive to restore trust and transparency online. Before we dive into the showcase, I'll do a quick overview of the CAI, the open source tools and content credentials, which our speakers are gonna show throughout today's event in each of their individual showcases. Adobe founded the CAI in 2019 to address two broad problems. First, for creators to get credit for their work. Second, to address myths and disinformation, to bring a level of truth about how things were made rather than detecting how things might've been falsified. As many of us experienced throughout numerous global elections these last few years, and more recently, the viral generative AI content that made the news this week that briefly caused the stock market to drop, online content when used out of context or for misleading purposes has the potential to cause real world impact and harm. Part of the CAI solution is to surface provenance information. What's provenance? It's that SAP word, I know, but it originates from the art world and simply means origin. In the case of digital content, provenance data tells us who created that piece of content and how it was edited along its life cycle, from creation, editing, to publishing. And this is packaged into a new kind of metadata called content credentials. I recently heard a photographer compare this to a suitcase for content. It's also like a nutritional label that when enabled, the secure tamper evident content credentials travel through your file wherever it goes. That allows us to experience context together. Through content credentials, we're empowering people to create a dig digital chain of custody for photography, video, audio, generative AI, and other media types. You can enable content credentials today in Photoshop, in Lightroom, and it's coming to more Adobe Creative Cloud apps very soon. Um, here you can see I uploaded a photograph I've made to the social platform Behance, which integrates and supports content credentials viewing. The CAI team has been very busy. Um, they launched a website called Verify, which, it, which is a user-friendly content credentials reader. And here you can see and inspect assets to learn more about its history and compare changes. To ensure transparency in generative AI, Adobe Firefly attaches content credentials to all of its downloads. So as you can see here, I generated this text using Firefly. And very soon, Verify will support video and audio. And I'm very happy to report that you'll get to see a preview of this in our first showcase. Um, so this idea is only effective when it has broad adoption. And the foundation for broad adoption are technical standards. The C2PA lays out the technical standard and underpinning of trust. Trust is being derived from chains of tamper evident digital signatures that make up content credentials. Again, who made it, how it was made, what editing tools or AI model was used, et cetera. The CAI's open source tools activate the C2PA standard. This makes it easy to integrate secure provenance signals to websites, apps, or services. So please take a look and explore which one makes sense for your organization or business. Um, we'll post a link to the chat to join us on Discord as well, where there are very lively conversations about implementation and conversation with the CAI team. Um, now you see how this ecosystem is taking shape today. Um, I'm excited to introduce our first showcase by Reese Beecher. Reese Feature was founded in 2018 to provide high fidelity voice cloning AI. Their award-winning speech, synthetic speech technology was among the first to be adopted by Hollywood studios. Of note, and for you Star Wars fans watching out there, um, Reese Feature worked with Lucasfilms and Disney to clone Mark Hamill's voice for The Mandalorian. When James Earl Jones retire, retires, his voice for Darth Vader will come courtesy of Reese Feature's software. 
We all know that you do not have to be a Hollywood studio to use generative AI software. Um, and as Reese Fisher brings their tech to individual sound professionals and creators, they're also providing safeguards as part of its use. With that, let's bring up Reese Fisher CTO and co-founder Dimitro Belichstov joining us from Kiev. Hey, Dimitro. Uh, hi, everyone. And yeah, thanks a lot for the for the introduction. So. Yeah, let me start um, from just quickly giving you an overview of what Respeacher is all about. So over the last five years or so, Respeacher has been building this high quality speech to speech voice cloning system that um, that uh, that Colleen just mentioned, and uh, we've successfully used it for movies and games. And speech to speech in this case means uh, just means that it receives speech on the input instead of text and produces the output in a desired voice by feeding it through our AI model. And this lets actors perform in other voices, not just say things. So here I'm going to quickly uh, highlight the you know, important properties of speech to speech that make it, um, make it special in, some, uh, in many, in many um, uh, ways. So aside from uh, unrivaled audio quality that, is, that can be used in movies, Cool thing about speech to speech is that it supports a lot of like a wide range of emotions, and then it also lets you lets actors control those emotions by acting and performing in the exact way they want. Now, also we control accents because um, content creators might want to have diverse accents for their characters and their games or or movies they're creating, as well as it's language agnostic because we work in acoustic space, right? So we only care about sounds and their sequences and how they play together, but we, our model doesn't really care about how language works. And by that, we are able to support a pretty you know, rare languages and work with, with any acoustic space. And also, again, because it's a speech-to-speech -speech system, naturally, it is a good fit for nonverbal things like you know, humming, exc exclamations, as well as singing. Um, among the examples of, of this, so our tech has been used successfully on a big screen, as again, uh, Colleen mentioned, like the voice of Luke Skywalker for, um, for The Mandalorian, The Book of Boba Fett, and the uh, voice of James Earl Jones as Darth Vader for the uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi series. We also did the voice of Vince Lombardi for the Super Bowl ad. We worked on God of War Ragnarok one of the biggest games of 2022. Unfortunately, we can't say what we did there exactly, but you're, you're free to guess. And um, also there's, uh, we did the uh, voice of Elvis on America's Got Talent, we worked with Aloe Black for creating a tribute song to um, Avicii and you know many other projects. So now we've also built a web platform called Respeacher Marketplace which uh, where anyone can use our tech to generate expressive synthetic speech for, for their content. So I'd really encourage you to uh, check it out yourself and use the QR code to, um, to register and, and try converting some speech. Now, because we care a lot about ethics and responsible AI, I'm very proud to say that we're, we're the first company to um, automatically add content credentials to all generated speech on our platform. So to demonstrate you, now I'm gonna, now I just wanna demonstrate you how this could work in an example pipeline. So let's say we wanna narrate a video. We have a video and we wanna make a voiceover for, that, for this. So step one in this case would be to create, um, go ahead to our favorite audio editing software. Like in this case, I'm gonna use Audacity and record, record a track. So here you see Audacity. So let me just go ahead and press the record button and uh, record something. A slow motion is the best effect to make your video um, thoughtful and dramatic. Okay, let's say this is what we wanna use for our track. So I'm gonna go ahead and save it, export it as a wave file to a folder. Let's call it input.wave and click okay. So now that now that's that out of the way, let me um, also show you how we can use. Um, let me go to the terminal here real quick. Here we are. So hopefully you can see it. Uh, uh, here's 
if I do ls, here you can see the input wave file that I just created. And so I'm going to show you this uh, C2PA command line tool that uh, is also open source. And it's uh, designed, its purpose is to be able to add content credentials to all sorts of media and also to inspect uh, the metadata. So in this case, let, let us do minus D, which just means uh, inspect and specify the file that I just created in Audacity. And it's going to tell us that there's no claim found because Audacity doesn't support, you know, signing audio with with um, content credentials. So I want to sign it anyway. So and for that, I created this um, Dimitro JSON config, which just uh, says that it contains my name here and the fact that I'm a person. So I'm going to use it to sign my audio before you know submitting it anywhere. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna call C two P A um, tool. A tool. I'm gonna use minus M to specify the the config. I'm gonna say that I want to write it to input. Um, let's say input signed. Dot wave, and I'm gonna specify that I want to sign which file I want to sign. And here's my input dot wave that I just created in Audacity. It's gonna take a little, and then once once that's done, we can again inspect the signed file here and see that I'm going to scroll up. There's a lot of technical information here, but what's important is that now on this file we can see that it is indeed um, it has an assertion which claims that it has been created by uh, by me. So now that I, now that I have my file signed, I can. Um, then go to Respeech for Marketplace and try to uh, convert it to a different voice because I don't like my voice for some reason and I want to use this other voice to narrate our video. So what you see now is the interface of, it's the new interface of Respeech for Marketplace. And uh, I've created, uh, pre-created a project for this demo here. So I'm going to just click it. And the first thing that we need to do is to upload the input file, which is just my speech. I'm going to go to new original, select the file upload, uh, click to upload the file. And then I'm going to select the input signed file that I just uh, signed. So let me just play it back quickly so that we make sure that it's the file that I created. Oh, there's no audio. All right, let me uh, let me quickly try it again. Okay, tap sharing should help us with this. So let me try it again. A slow motion is the best effect to make your video um, thoughtful and dramatic. All right, cool. So hopefully you could hear that, and uh, indeed that's that's what I just recorded. So let me. I'm happy with that. Let me go ahead and choose voices that I want to convert it to, and say I like I like Spencer. Spencer is my is my guy. Here he is. I'm gonna just use everything like all the default settings here, because he sounds great to my in my opinion. I'm just gonna go ahead and add voice, and hit convert. So now we see that there's this original file here and a, a conversion that's being processed um, right now. It's going to take a couple of moments. Oh, there we are. So let's uh, let's check out how how he sounds. A slow motion is the best effect to make your video um, thoughtful and dramatic. There we go. So let's say I like it. Uh, I like it much more than than my original recording. By the way, I just wanted to reiterate again that Respeech Marketplace now signs all generated audio with um, content credentials that just say that Respeecher Marketplace has been used to generate this audio. So the previous step that I did for signing my input audio is is optional. And uh, like in future, in the interface, we'll also add an option for uh, the users to um, to optionally add their name as creators to the um, to the content credentials so that they could be credited. So with that out of the way, let me just click the download button and uh, save it somewhere. So 
So now that it's saved, uh, I can use the let me let me go back to the terminal and use the con the same tool that I used before to inspect what happened to the file. So let me stuff and let's say we want to have a detailed view of the file input signed wave Spencer, which is the file that I just downloaded from the marketplace and it's the file that contains the converted speech. It's not my voice anymore. Okay, so this is, again, a lot of technical information, but uh, importantly, we can see that my personal content creden credentials have been preserved. So it still says that it's been created by um, Dimitro Bilesov. But also if we scroll up here a bit, we can see that there's new claim added that it was authored by um, Respeacher. Which, which just means that it was generated by our voice marketplace product. And in this case, uh, we use test app credentials for this case because we're still waiting for the global, um, for the content authority to issue a company certificate. Um, but soon we'll, we'll just use the, um, their certificate instead of, instead of a test a certificate that we used for this, um, for this demo. Now, the last thing I wanted to show is a quick preview of what it's gonna, um, of how these content credentials will appear in um, the upcoming version of the Verify tool that Colleen just mentioned. So let me switch here real quick. So hopefully you can see the, um, the tool here. And now the tool, I'm gonna assume that I've, I took the file that I just created and edited it back, like stitched it together with a video, let's say in Adobe Premiere or in any other video editor. And now I'm gonna go select inspect new file and just drop the video that I just created there. And in a moment, you'll see that we have some interesting stuff going on here. So if I switch to overview, we can see a tree here, which um, says that, so this, this box here is my, um, the actual video file. And we see that it has three ingredients in it. And these, these ingredients are related to like a thumbnail and the actual video that, that's present in the video file. But also importantly, now we have uh, this guy here, which if we look at the content credential a sidebar here, we can see that it was produced by your feature and produced the, you know, with, with this test signing certificate. So it just says that the audio that's contained in the video is indeed generated by your and also, interestingly, because I chose to sign the input audio file before submitting it to the marketplace, we can see that we also respect the history and the original file, my, my voice that I created, uh, that is also credited here as a child of the converted file, as an ingredient of the converted file. So if I click here, you can see that it was created by Dimitra Bilitsov in Audacity and then you can kind of tell that it was, you know, processed by Respeacher Marketplace. So I think that wraps it up and I'm ready to, for some questions. All right, thanks so much, Dimitro. I know we have a couple of questions, but we're going to shape, save it for the Q&A portion. Um, so we'll see you there. And I'm going to introduce our next showcase. Um, but first, let me say two firsts there, and congrats to the Respeacher Re team. Um, first, to provide a layer of verifiable transparency for synthetic audio, and to preview the CAI's upcoming update to Verify, which will soon read content credentials for video and audio. Um, you showed us very clearly that chain of provenance that you created from your audio file to Respeacher's marketplace to when you put it as part of a video, in that case, um, in Premiere and elsewhere where it could be supported. All right. Um, a reminder to please post your questions in chat and we'll get to them after the showcase. Next up, we'll, we're gonna bring up Patrick Krupa, who is the founder and head of product at SmartFrame. Patrick was previously a designer having owned a creative agency. He also owned a printing press. And I think this is a pretty fun fact, he founded a language school and a techno club before starting SmartFrame. So I'm gonna to have to call him next time I'm in Berlin. Um, SmartFrame enables creator attribution and displays provenance through content management and digital publishing. Um, with that, let's bring up let's bring up Patrick. 
Hi, welcome everyone. Thanks, Colleen. Um, so I, I would like to start with a, a quick uh, history of uh, smart frame and, and uh, about 10 years ago, that was uh, uh, just in context of internet, uh, that was when uh, Bitcoin was $754. So that was a long, long time ago. <laughs> I started, uh, decided to start a platform for uh, photographers. I've always been a fan of photography and uh, met uh, some professional photographers, wanted to create a beautifully designed portfolio platform. And uh, during that process, I uh, met um, during the process of product development of, of conceptualizing the platform, I met uh, lots of uh, professional photographers working for uh, Reuters, AFP, Getty Images, etc. Some of them uh, lost their friends uh, uh, at the front line. Some of them risked their lives to take uh, photographs as, as during war and in sort of crisis uh, situations. So a lot of a lot of interesting experience there. And uh, we, I thought that it needs to be respected, and it's. Uh, Definitely deserves uh, deserves some some technology to so, to support it, and um, most of these all all of these photographers that uh, I met, uh, they, we asked them a question: what What is the main problem with with your with your sort of job with your work? And a copyright infringement was was definitely one of the one of the main issues. So. Uh, and that's how uh, the the first sort of iteration of the product uh, originated. That was a, a platform for photographers called uh, Pixarites, and uh, we uh, looked for technical means to to prevent images from being stolen. And we invented SmartFrame. That uh, we built SmartFrame into that platform, and that was uh, obviously a very early version of um, uh, SmartFrame. Uh, quite quite sort of uh, uh, not not what it is today. Uh, so just to fast forward now. Um, the uh, smart frame is now the uh, has expanded uh, its its sort of uh, uh, functionality and offers offers a host uh, offers basically a, a comprehensive platform for uh, protecting and distributing images. So um, it, it's it's a very okay and. Um, is and obviously and and it provides a very 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 uh, unusual statistics that you normally don't see on images like images uh, don't uh, usually come with any sort of statistics you don't you don't know what happens with them you throw them out on the internet and they just they just have their own life they get stripped of attribution metadata and uh, smart frame uh, is is a different concept where the image is basically embedded and it and, and you know where it's embedded and uh, what happens with this image, what websites it's displayed on, uh, etc. So the uh, smart frame offers a very unique platform for distributing images, but also for, for monetizing them. Um, and that's uh, when uh, content authenticity came along, it, it felt like a perfect match, just uh, su supporting that that. Uh, 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 supporting that uh, mission of of, of smart frame very uh, very well and complementing the the security features of of, of smart frame because smart frame provides security in browser it doesn't require any any software to be to be installed uh, in your in your browser so obviously it's limited to what browsers offer so the first um the first uh, prototype of uh, of uh, content uh, authenticity enabled smart frame image was the uh, captured by uh, a quite famous wildlife photographer called David Yarrow. Um, he uh, we actually got uh, courtesy of uh, the uh, content authenticity team. We uh, could borrow one of the prototype handsets with. Uh, Content authenticity uh, software built into into it. That's uh, the Trupic software, and David Yarrow took a picture of that lion um, uh, using using that handset, and uh, and then we 
we we developed a prototype using uh, JavaScript SDK. Uh, back then, I don't think we had uh, access to the command line tool. I think JavaScript SDK was was like one of the first tools, and we integrated that tool into the smart frame, kind of overlaying it uh, on 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 the smart frame, and. Um, it worked. It worked well. It's we could actually present an image with the content credentials, um, uh, uh, but it. But we decide we we encountered a couple of uh, issues, and we we decided not to make it part of the product. We decided to wait for the for the uh, full sort of um, a command line tool, and the reason was that. A smart frame comes with uh, several interface uh, elements and one of them or there's always something in the top left hand corner and when uh, that content authenticity icon gets loaded into uh, into the image uh, we actually don't know if that icon is going to be there because if the image doesn't have credentials then uh, obviously that icon will be missing so so we can't just leave a gap for that icon so we decided that detecting this this um whether content credentials uh, exist uh, server side would be much uh, better for us and also that uh, decoding uh, the manifest in the browser in the client uh, on the client computer sometimes it took one two seconds so it wasn't um ideal uh, so we we had we we created prototype we decided to to wait uh, before we hand it over to um, our users so the next uh, slide please um, so when the c2pa tool came along we this we integrated that server side into our image management platform and that really worked very well because we we using c2pa tool to extract the manifest and then we developed uh, our own tool based on uh, rust sdk to extract assets or ingredients of, of of the photograph so we have a full picture of the uh, content credentials before the image is actually rendered before it's actually distributed we already know that that image contains content credentials so when we um display that image when we display image in this in the smart frame format we already know whether content credentials are present or not so this this gives us also the the freedom to uh, display them in, in different ways so if if that eye icon is not uh, suitable and uh, we have a use case where uh, it's it's not exactly suitable for for the for the design or for the uh, customers re requirement requirements we uh, can put content credentials next to the copyright information into the uh, image caption next to photographer's name so that gives us extra extra flexibility and also performance wise we don't have to load any of the um, cai uh, software into the client browser we just need to load that uh, information about uh, link to content credentials and then we um we display content content credentials inside of the smart frame i'm going to show uh, you a quick preview how it works this technology is available to all of our all of our users it's uh it's now fully public and uh anyone with a smart frame uh, account can use it i'm uh i'm going to upload so this is uh a smart frame uh, image management uh, console and uh, i'm going to upload an image that i uh, prepared which i took yeah i took in tokyo a couple of years ago here we go okay uh, so as you can see the content credentials icon is is visible straight away in the uh, administration area uh, so the users can filter users can filter see see which images uh, have content credentials for example before they even distribute them and uh, now when I want to use this image, I can uh, 
I can grab an embed code. I can paste paste it into a website, into a blogger platform, or into WordPress platform, any any website that uh, supports embedding. And uh, this smart frame will uh, be uh, distributed uh, in this uh, in this exactly sort of format, including content uh, credentials. I'm just uh, Need to switch the theme because I think I've got the wrong theme. The wrong theme at the moment. Yeah. Um, and and I show you what this uh, uh, what this image looks like when it's embedded. And so content credentials icon can look like this, can be here in the corner before before any other interface is displayed. And when I click on that uh, icon, uh, you, I can I can see all of the modifications to to the file assets used, and uh, there's also a link to the verify website. So if I want to sort of look deeper into the history or verify it on another using another C2PA tool. I can just go and and see the same information here. So what SmartFrame does here as uh, it just makes it really user friendly and and really really easy easy to use. So you don't have to um, have any sort of programming knowledge, access to the server or anything like that. This is just uh, allows it, anyone who has a SmartFrame account can just. Uh, Take these um, images and um, with content credentials, upload them to to SmartFrame platform, and then just just use them with content credentials right there in in the image. And the, when the image gets embedded on on other uh, websites, also contains things like uh, a caption, uh, attribution, photographer's name, and and further sort of sharing tools. So wherever this image goes. It will it 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 will contain these these content credentials. So, um, so that's how SmartFrame works. That's how we that's how we uh, integrated this um, uh, technology. And uh, definitely, we're just going to stop sharing now. Um, second. Okay. Just a few few final words about uh, uh, about what's coming uh, next. So, uh, so at the moment to see the asset history, you have to you have to go to a verify website. So the smart frame only shows the current uh, credentials that the the sort of last uh, last version of it. Uh, we decided that it's obviously much uh, better user experience to not to leave smart frame so uh, the asset history will be built into the smart frame when when you when you click view more you will basically the smart frame will expand uh, full screen and and in a like a bit of a gallery view it will show the history of the image so you, you will be able to go back uh, and and sort of see the history see the ingredients see see where the where the image originated so uh, that's going to be uh, available uh, later this year uh, we also um uh, realized that uh, sending full um, resolution image to verify website is not necessarily uh, ideal because uh, we could potentially expose uh, those assets that content owners are trusting us with so uh, we um, we're going to be, uh, create a thumbnail that's a representation of the image so basically the same image just a little bit smaller uh, and sign it and then send that uh, thumbnail to a verify website just to prevent that potential image theft because uh, we we do we're dealing with not just users we're dealing with and so smart frame provides protection from from bots for from all kinds of automated uh 
programs that uh, hunt the web, uh, web, web pages or internet for images and try to download them. So obviously it's important for us that if content owner trusts us with, with an image, we don't expose image in a full resolution and, and traditional JPEG format. So it's uh, a smart frame doesn't contain JPEG format, doesn't contain any image format. It's a, it's a streaming technology that streams images uh, to the browser without uh, transmitting files so it's just we draw directly on html canvas so if we eliminate any other stuff leaks like like we don't send images to verify a website or any anywhere else we we save then the images is, is saved and um, just um uh, the the last thing I want to briefly uh, um, mention is um the the business model we uh Apart from protecting assets and 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 uh, it's 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 also the, the content credentials also give us a opportunity to um, to confirm that that the image belongs to a certain content owner and we're working with we're currently working with uh, two global brands I can't <laughs> tell the names yet but it will be all uh, public in about in a couple of weeks. Uh, two major major global brands um, and we uh, use content credentials to confirm that the the images uh, uh, that we're distributing they belong to official um, sort of photography uh, collections is like a badge of authenticity uh, it's it's um it's, it's a kind of new new business model and and uh, it's uh, the images that uh, are distributed using using this um, uh, concept are uh, distributed for free and then uh, the traffic is actually what what pays for 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 the images or to provides provides uh, monetization or revenue channel to the publishers creators and content owners so we're basically displaying high quality advertising uh, on, on on the image for a couple of seconds uh, and and then the the advertising disappears and uh, the image is revealed. So uh, that's that's kind of the the business model we're pursuing at the, at the moment. Um, so I I think I can, yeah I definitely covered everything for today. I would uh, if if anyone's interested to hear to learn more about SmartFrame, please uh, visit our website. Please. Uh, get in touch with me obviously directly uh, if you want and i'd be very happy to to answer any questions thank you over to you colleen amazing thank you so much patrick that just wow i would like to use smart frame for my photos asap um clearly there's a use case for global brands so very excited to hear your upcoming announcements on that and how all of this is going to come into place in the wild as we see it wherever we go for content. So congrats and thank you. We'll see you for the show for the showcase Q&A. Um, for those joining us for the first time, thanks again. Please post any questions in the chat and all of our showcase presenters will address them towards the end. Now, let me introduce our next showcase from the Guardian Project. We're joined by Nathan Friedis, founder and director at The Guardian Project, which is an award-winning open source mobile security collaborative with a global user base. Their most well-known app, which I need to download or bought, has been installed more than 20 million times. It brings the Tor anonymity and circumvention network to mobile devices. In addition to, to his work at The Guardian Project, Nathan is also, also an affiliate fellow at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard, Today he'll be joining, he'll be showing how the Guardian's um, Guardian Project's proof mode app and platform turns action into verifiable data. Let's bring up Nathan. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Colleen. Um, I titled my presentation today Interoperable, Interoperable Ecosystems for Trust. And I'm really glad I named it that because between with SmartFrame and Respeecher, I'm already seeing that ecosystem. You know, I have ideas where the work we're doing can build on. And I know that um, our communities really need a variety of tools, right, for the kind of output that they're looking to have. Um, but yeah, Guardian Project is a little bit different from a traditional company. Um, we come out of the human rights space, out of the free software and open source space, out of the academic space. 
And we've been working on privacy on mobile devices for um, 15 years, and I've been in the mobile industry for 10 years beyond that. Um, and we really care about like that these things are are powerful, these little supercomputers in our pocket, um, that they are, you know, with cameras, it's actually not just a smartphone, it's a smart camera. This is something we've worked on for a long time, but we also see the downsides and the huge privacy risks. And so, yeah, here's a bunch of our team who, uh, yeah, they don't want to show their face all the time and be identified by content credentials, perhaps. So um, I'm here today to talk about someone. Mode. Oh, wait. Proof mode is oh, a sorry. system this that enables AI. authentication and verification what are you doing? of multimedia get off, get off the screen. content. Okay, so so that was not a real person. Um, these are real people, and um, I can verify that. And I think in the future, maybe we'd have a smart frame, uh, a headshot of each of these folks here. But we have a really fantastic team working um, on a variety of fronts where we're taking the concept, the sort of data science route around metadata, provenance, authentication, smart cameras. Um, we're building platform tools, mobile apps around that. We're working with communities on the ground around the world, um, applying this technology. We have partners integrating our code into other apps like Tela, Save, even Signal. And um, we're doing thinking about what is the user experience in these kind of points of capture and also within a, a human rights and humanitarian workflow. And then we have a fantastic partners like Witness who have been a, a, a big player and participant in the content authenticity initiative and the push for these standards and kind of our work with them on, on proof mode and Informacam before that has been a, a predecessor to all of this, but um, the C2PA is beyond our sort of wireless dreams as, part, as far as where it's gone. So for us, a lot of our work began looking at misinformation and disinformation um, as a problem within uh, journalistic work, advocacy, human rights, humanitarian documentation. And um, there's specifically four areas, imposter content, fabricated content, manipulated content, and false context. I think what's important to note with this slide is that there's a lot of fantastic research, detailed thinking, and understanding of what the problems are, when and where. It's not just sort of fake photo, deep fake. Uh, Witness has a lot of work on this. Um, First Draft, others at um, Harvard and many other fine institutions are thinking deeply about generative AI, about manipulated uh, media. And so we are building on this understanding with our work. Um, proof mode itself, in the end, is a, a mobile app uh, because we want to build like everything we do is meant to be very tangible and useful. Um, it's a open source mobile app for Android and iOS, um, and it does. Uh, it, it's been around for like over five years, maybe even longer. And so we do a lot of the C2PA things with signing and provenance and attestations. We but we use PGP instead of X509 certificates. Um, we do notarization to a number of third-party services, some built on blockchain, others using things like Google safety net technology or Apple's, because we actually want to also authenticate the device itself. Um, we, connect, we collect other metadata that's contextual data that's useful for investigations and war crimes and kind of uh, civil rights um, issues, but also for um, data science work around uh, climate change. So we... we we do a lot of these things in proof mode and it's it's out there as a standard light and technology um, in a library, but it's available really as apps on a phone today. And what you get is a bundle in a zip with photos and metadata and keys and signing that can be easily shared, say through a secure system like Signal, but you could also post it on the web um, and use it in a variety of ways, which I'll talk about next. So one of the things we've done to kind of teach people in different contexts about disinformation and misinformation in photos is to make games. So we actually have created a scavenger hunt games at major kind of conferences and events using proof mode to teach people how to go and collect things, <clears throat> share them, verify them in a documented way. Um, and it's really fun. And a lot of our work is in training and advocacy around this because there's Again, great tools like SmartFrame could be very useful in the human rights space, but we need to let people know, know about it and know how to use it. Um, and so we do a lot of this sort of work. We have a, a model that um, Jack Fox, who's our data science lead, came up with for verification that we call our three-layer verification 
Um, integrity is one piece of that. That's just checking signatures, checking third party notaries, you know, is the bundle of bits called a photo or a video or an audio file? Is this, uh, you know, still whole and not manipulated? Then we have the idea of consistency, which is if you have a series of photos or videos from the same device or from the same event, is all, are all of the signals internally consistent? Or does something look out of place? You know, is there something that should be flagged for needing more investigation? And then we have the idea of synchrony, which is did this, where this happened kind of, does it make sense that of the time and place and the weather and the Wi-Fi and all the other signals we can pick up, you know, the context it was in, does that make sense for what this event was supposed to be documented? And so that is a process that we've come up with. And on our website, we have uh, manual ways to do that process. And we have a proof check tool, um, which is in beta, that is um, takes you through the various steps um, and has some other features integrated. And I'll show more about that now. But this is a, a progressive web app that embeds the C2PA JavaScript tool when you run it on the web. And it also then uses the Rust tool in a desktop format. So we'll talk about that. But this is where you run that check and you can be kind of do a smoke test to say, hey, is this legitimate before maybe moving on to deeper layers of verification? Um, this was the, these are the winners of a uh, Hunt NYC event. And so basically uh, they were the first two people to capture all six items, send the proof over signal to me. We ran it through a verification process and then they won AirPods, um, which was pretty fun. And that was courtesy of our partners and funder at the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, um, because all of their data was actually stored on uh, decentralized storage like Filecoin and IPFS. So these are the kind of activities we do. We've also done this in other countries around the world, teaching people how to do verification. Here's a uh, trash pickup of that my kids and I did, and we every photo of every piece of trash and thing we found on the beach is is verified. And you and then all of the data in the context. So we sort of took what's a, a regular just beach cleanup and made it a verified data event that can now be used to uh, as a record in time and maybe combined with all the other data of what kind of trash, where, how, and all the context into something that can be used in a data science context. Most importantly, through working with Starling Labs um, and the Haifa Worker Cooperative and other projects, we were part of a cryptographic dossier submitted to the International Criminal Court uh, around war crimes against Russia and bombing of schools in Kharkiv in Ukraine. And so proof mode was a piece of that set of documents and evidence that was uh, used to capture direct point of view from a smartphone camera. Um, and then that went into a chain of data that involved C2PA attestations and a really amazing piece of work that um, we're so proud of being a part of and that Starling Lab really and Haifa deserve so much credit for. So this is kind of where we're all going with this work um, around being able to make sure we're getting evidence in a format for justice and human rights applications. So we are an interoperable ecosystem with C2PA. And this means, you know, we're doing our thing. We have our metadata, we have our open source code and libraries. It works in one way that's very important because it enables a certain class of devices and people to participate that maybe some of the more commercial C2PA offerings do not. But at the point of proof check verification, we link these two worlds. And so through the proof check tool, you can export a C2PA signed version of your photo and eventually video and audio that has the proof check verification report inside of it. This then shows up in the verify tool, it shows up in Photoshop, and that links you all back into the, the proof check verification, originally back to the source files. So this is really exciting that we can kind of create this interoperability all the way to the point of capturing data off the sensor of the camera. And so um, this is just a quick screenshot showing, and it's a little small, um, that you, using the desktop proof check tool, you can export media file with an embedded C2PA manifest. Um, this is then the, a version of that same photo edited in Photoshop. And you can see on the right, the if I take it to verify, actually, we edited it, we cropped it, we published it. You can see some of the metadata under the social media links that links back into proof mode. But this was actually an interesting case where I took a screenshot 
Uh, and then I use Verify to find the version of the photo that I had published to the Creative Cloud. And it was really neat to see that whole chain of events from someone taking a screenshot using the possible matches feature of Verify to find the authentic metadata that led me back to the source. It's like really mind blowing and super exciting. Um, yeah, so you can see we have our Guardian Project proof check uh, as, uh, assertion in there along with everything else. And we're using the both SDKs and we're very excited for the Rust SDK on mobile because then we'll be able to integrate a claim right away at point of capture. Today that happens in the proof check tool. Um, so we have all of our metadata is embedded in C2PA. So you can use just like you saw in Respeacher that to kind of extract all of this more decentralized verification within our um, claim. And then most excitingly, we are using the do not train flags to control usage for AI model training in our latest release. And so as you're capturing documentary evidence of say a, a, a war, this is probably not content you necessarily want to be used to in generative AI, unless you, you know, it's not never that, but by default right now, we're saying our purpose is not to create content for training, but we know that some of our users may want to do that to be an authentic, organic, you know, sort of green from the soil root media that is known to be um, authentic. And some may want to say, yes, please train because that's what I, I want. But for now, we're really excited to have this capability um, and be able to integrate it. Backstopping all of this is the harms modeling that um, Witness and others did in the C2PA um, specification. If you haven't read it, please read it. It's super important. And we keep this in our mind at all times when working on this project. So I'm gonna speed up because time is uh, fleeting, but our big idea is through a project we call Baseline, which you could think of as a sort of a Wikipedia of verified media from around the globe, documenting the planet from all points and all places and all viewpoints using this authenticated kind of foundation. We want this to happen collectively in different ways in different communities. We're, we're funding and supporting a number of people around the world doing this today. Um, this was a photo walk I did in Costa Rica, a beautiful garden, and this creates some sort of documentation about that. Uh, more importantly, we're working with the El Soto Resiste, an indigenous caravan in Mexico, documenting sites that are being lost to development and climate change. And they're using proof mode to create this archive of verified media. We're working with journalists um, in Middle East and North Africa to use proof mode and C2PA as a sort of B-roll backstop, providing the context for their stories and so that they can have all of that documentation available and then they can build stories out of it. And again, some of the work that I see with Respeacher and um, SmartFrame, very applicable to these folks. And um, yeah, and then we're working with them to, to store this resiliently on the decentralized web. We think we don't want content that is important stored in one place. The interplanetary file system and Filecoin provide a way that we can store these things and communities of people can make sure they don't disappear. And all of our tools interoperate with that um, and that entire decentralized model approach here. So yeah, so talk to us, proofmode.org slash proofcore. Um, we have developer libraries, a number of partners integrating this code like Tela and Save. And we did a prototype with Signal we were excited about. So yeah, um, and that's actually me verified and you can find me on proof mode. So thank you so much. We love seeing the verified you, Nathan. Thank you so much. Um, I think like you said, how we create an ecosystem for transparency requires participation. Um, I love that scavenger hunt idea that not everyone want, will want to inspect and do digital forensics, but on top of open technical solutions, we need digital, digital and media literacy. So thank you for making that fun and relevant for important use cases like verified evidence um, that you and the CAI has collaborated on with Witness and others. Um, let's get into Q&A and bring everyone up. I think if there's one theme across everyone's showcase, it's that it's an open community with open technical standards uh, with flexible technology as well. Well, several themes, not one theme. Um, since we are showcasing how you activate the C2PA and um, the CAI's open source tools, uh, a, a question for the group, what challenges did you face when integrating C2PA and CAI tech into your businesses, into your apps? 
if any. Yeah. Well, I heard Dimitri, Dimitro was waiting for a call from Global Sign, and I'll I'll say the certificate process <laughs> is tricky. We there is some good self signed certificates sent. You know, Global Sign. It's a little fragile, and we're figuring it out. Um, we, we'd really like to integrate on like UB keys and things like this as well. So, um, yeah, that part. But I think the SDKs have been iterating and improving and documentation pretty quickly. So if you've been challenged before, I'd take take a look again, and and things keep getting easier. I know the team loves documentation, so thanks for digging into that and participating in it. Um, Dimitra, a quick question for you. Now I'm thinking about this while you are demoing. Can anyone upload any voice to Respeecher today? A famous voice, perhaps? Yeah, right now we're sort of explicitly prevent that from uh, from happening because um, you know there's a big potential for for misuse if it was like freely available. If you could just like upload any sample, like Barack Obama or something, and just speak with their voice. So like right now we don't have that feature. We just have a library of voices that um, gave their permission, but uh, we do want to add that ability, that possibility in future. We just want to make sure to have implemented proper approval and uh, security layers so that voice owners uh, should be able to um, approve the content that's been created uh, by their voices. And also, of course, we need a, a, a reward layer there so that, it, you know, the, the owners of the voices could be rewarded for, for, you know, allowing others to use their voice. Makes total sense. Um, question to everyone, this is pretty straightforward, but how prominent should content credentials be in mainstream media? I think we saw a pretty recent example earlier this week when um, allegedly one source went viral for posting that generated image of a fire at the Pentagon. If I may answer this, I, I think it should be like SSL certificate. It should just yeah. become an absolute standard. Like you don't go to a website without SSL certificate and you just shouldn't look at an image or, or any media for that matter, video or audio, if it doesn't have content credentials. I think that's, this is going to be big. I think. Yeah, and I I can imagine, I, I was just talking about that today, this transition from HTTP to HTTPS, from unencrypted to encrypted messages, and I think this is another wave. And I can even imagine on broadcast television having a QR code come up that you could scan or some other way to pick these things up throughout throughout the broadcast. So yeah, Patrick's work on that with smart frame seems to be leading the way. It would be interesting to see how various people and implementers implements the interaction aspect of it. Um, obviously, there will be UX standards, especially for content credentials. But yeah, to your point, Nathan, I think we need to make it easy for consumers and any viewers. Thanks for that. Um, Dimitro is, let's see, how does a user interact with content credentials in least featured? I think you, you mentioned this earlier, but for anyone joining late, Right. Yeah. So currently, we we just rolled out the um, the automatic signing, so that under the hood, uh, all the generated audio is has content credentials in it. Once once the uh, JavaScript um, tool supports audio content credentials, we'll also incorporate that in the uh, in the interface so that users can you know click on an info button and see the content credentials of both the audio they submitted, but also the audio that's been uh, generated. Um, also, as I mentioned before, we are planning to add as soon as possible the ability, and again, in our interface to um, opt in to kind of credit yourself as a creator so that um, so, so that the, the content credentials of include include the author of the input audio as well. Got it. I need to uh, sign up to the app and your, your marketplace test it out. Um, thanks for sharing that. Um, Nathan, one question for you on the Proof Mode app. How is it integrating or is it integrating content credentials on devices? I mean, any minute now <laughs> with the Rust SDK on, on mobile, we're, we, we have a lot of experience with Rust on mobile. So we're sort of, uh, yeah, we, we plan to integrate it at point of capture in the app on it as soon as we can, um, it's underway. 
and also with verification um, as well. I mean, we have our centralized, it's not centralized. We have our proof check tool, which is a decentralized tool. In fact, all the processing happens locally in, in that tool once you open it. Um, but then we want every mobile app to be able to pull something up and kind of offer um, that capability in our library and in our application. Um, another interesting thing I just wanted to bring up re regarding harms and regarding challenges, you know, we have a, another popular app called ObscuraCam. It was one of the first apps we built with Witness. And the whole point of that was to erase metadata and blur faces or redact information. This is still really an important use case. And we're trying to figure out how do we, right now we tell people use proof mode to document the evidence and then take the same picture and run it through ObscuraCam to blur faces. And that's what you share on social media while keeping kind of the evidence private until you need it. I think we're interested in some combination of these things where maybe there's a redacted privacy enhanced version that is C2PA signed as well, that kind of shows a link to the source material in a way that's still privacy enhanced and doesn't leak you know, faces and other things. So we're also thinking about how do we integrate these in uh, th this clear kind of ex um, user experience where, again, there's the, the evidence and the raw kind of uh, data, but then there's the thing you put online where you have to think about who you're protecting. Um, but yeah, we're really excited. Rust is a great choice. Rust on mobile uh, is working well for us. And uh, yeah, we're, as soon as we can get it in, I, I, I got to talk to Andy and the dev team and see where it's at. So. Awesome. I'm going to add an, on top of that, yeah. that uh, it's sort of, Exactly that. Um, in some in some cases, the speech feature is used uh, by by um, you know we, we use the tech for witness protection to anonymize voices to make sure that they they're not recognizable but still sound you know intelligible and and human because like in some you know if you're if you're using like some DSP tools it's oftentimes possible to kind of reverse it by applying yeah. like an inverse filter or something. But if you like resynthesize speech in that case, it's it's getting you know it's much harder to do so. So it, it is indeed sort of an interesting problem, which is similar to what you mentioned. Got it. I'm glad there's conversation here that you're all relating to. And I, I'll emphasize that um, if you read the C2PA spec, there is support for reduction as a mechanism, um, and which brings me, I think you've all you've all joined the CAI in different phases. The CAI was founded in 2019. Um, Patrick, you showed that case study we did a few years ago. Uh, I just want to ask how supportive or what would you recommend to the viewers today to be part of the community and how you'd like to collaborate in the future or today? I think I think I uh, would welcome some sort of uh, help from the other members because I think we we are facing the same issues while uh, integrating the technology because the, the obviously the tools you're providing are great the documentation is great but it's still uh, not, not 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 exact not exactly uh, a smooth ride, uh, especially if you haven't done it before. I'm not a, a, an a, an expert on uh, sort of security and signing certificates, and we we found that part as as uh, the the other um, speakers uh, mentioned. We found that part uh, pretty difficult, and uh, while obviously. Uh, you guys at um, uh, CA, CAI are very helpful. You have over a thousand members and you can't possibly do technical support for everyone. So I think uh, maybe expanding this community and, and sort of helping each other here would be, would be really, really good. And uh, maybe we need some tools for this, some platform or, or just, just connect a little bit more. So that's uh, definitely, we should be looking into that. I think it would help everyone. Thanks for that. We certainly hear you. That's a good cue to post um, the link to join the CAI on Discord, where we've broken down the types of um, open source tools for conversation and implementation support. Um, but I think that's a great idea, Patrick, and definitely something that we would love the community to get input as well on how you would like to see that happen. And obviously, being an open community, we do not control everything you do. So I think even in this conversation, it's obvious that there's already inklings of collaborations that will happen. Um, 
let's wrap up. I know we're at time. Any final words, Nathan and Dimitro? I guess I can just say that, uh, again, like a call to community and especially, you know, companies that generate, generate uh, content uh, like with, with, with AI and stuff and just to, you know, not hesitate to implement this because kind of the way it, the way it, the only way for it to make like a big impact is, is to, to have wide adoption of the, of the technology. And yeah, I mean, even though you kind of need to spend some time, you know, getting your head around the security concepts, the cryptography and stuff to implement it at the end of the day to make like a basic implementation, it doesn't take, you know, all that much. It's, it's kind of using the C2PA tool under the hood on your server side. Is that what we found? So it's, it is not scary at all. So the, the sooner, the better. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, there's a lot of opinions on generative AI. I think you're doing really impressive work at Resfeature, but the we also have this burden of we need to solve the provenance and authentication issue in an industry standard way now before like we're overwhelmed with trash and you know and fraud and pranks and harm. Um, you know we're going into an election cycle in the U.S. There's wars, as you know. There's a lot of um, ways this can be abused and. We, let's not go through the cycle of the web where there was terrible security and you know we had to get to HTTPS at least. Like I think the timing of C2PA and the promise of generative, generative AI are, are very well timed. And so I think we have, it's, it's, it's on all of us to like do this part to make sure that media that's digital and shared online can be trusted and still valued, so. Thanks for that, everyone. I, I almost want to end it at that. Go ahead, Patrick. I just want to say that uh, the implementations I've seen so far from other members and obviously including our efforts are, are the, I think, the key to to, to making this uh, technology, this, this concept uh, more popular because, uh, you know, not everyone will understand it like uh, c2pa tool is is great when you're a programmer or at least have some basic uh, uh basic sort of understanding of of programming or technology but we uh, i we've met on on our journey uh, publishers and content owners who have just don't just really afraid of 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 uh, spending sort of development time or or building this this technology in they don't understand the complex how it actually works this is like sometimes i i try to explain it uh, to to those people saying it's, it's a bit like blockchain and and it's it's um i i think uh, we need a little bit more time for this to settle in not everyone heard about it not everyone understands it and i think it probably and you know another couple of months or a year of really intense uh, sort of P PR uh, will, will definitely uh, help, but also easy to use implementations, user-friendly implementations. I'm not just talking about smart frame, obviously that's what we've done, but seeing more more implementations that can be actually shown to to a to a layman it's it's and it really opens opens uh, eyes. Uh, well said. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for presenting and showing us how you, you're doing this today. Um, we'll say goodbye to our speakers. Nice little button there to verifiably prove your actions today. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank All you. right. Thanks. Well, Have a good day. That is our community showcase. Thank you so much for joining live or watching the recording later on. Um, as you can see, as we saw throughout the showcase, the solutions are ready today. And this won't be the last showcase. Of course, we'll be highlighting more community members throughout the year. So please, again, get in touch with us on Discord or on LinkedIn. We'll post the links to the chat and the event description. So we, we hope you come away feeling inspired and ready to participate. Like Nathan and everyone said, it's going to take all of us. And we don't need watershed moments to get this done today. And it is happening now. Um, so join us and I hope you, I hope I see you for the next one. Thanks everyone.